All right. This is OpenStax U.S. History, Chapter 3, Creating New Social Orders, Colonial Societies, 1500 to 1700. We've got Section 1, Spanish Exploration and Colonial Society. So in terms of colonial societies, there are four countries that we're going to talk about. First is Spain, then France, the Netherlands, or we might call them the Dutch, uh, and then England. And so in this section, we're really only looking at Spanish colonial society. Again, colonial society would mean the society in New Spain, so Spain's possessions in the Americas. So a couple of things about Spanish society. Number one is the way that societies are organized. If you're not familiar with this term social pyramid, it's a good term to be familiar with when studying history. When you hear the word social, think about society. And when you hear the word pyramid, think of a pyramid, the shape of a pyramid. And typically what social pyramids help us do is to understand the way that society is organized. Typically, the people who have the most power and influence are on the top, but they're fewest in number. Then you might have a class of people who where there are a little bit more. And then finally, you have the underclass, which is typically the most in number, but has the least amount of power. So that's what a social pyramid is designed to represent. And when you study history and when you study various societies throughout the history of the world, uh, people have organized themselves socially in different ways. We'll talk a little bit about how the Spanish organized themselves in the, uh, in the New World. One important thing to take note of, and this was something covered in a previous chapter, the previous system of encomienda. Re recall that encomienda is a labor system. It is, in short, if we were used to just you know, describe it briefly, it is a form of Indian slavery. Uh, it essentially allowed for Spanish landowners to extract labor from any native peoples that lived on the land, which was recognized to be theirs by the Spanish king. Uh, however, thanks to people like Las Casas and things like the new laws, which banned encomienda, encomienda was replaced by repartimiento, right? And repartimiento is a new labor system. It differs from encomienda in that natives choose who works for Spanish landowners. So instead of the Spanish landowners extracting the labor, essentially labor is still required among the native population, but various tribes can choose who they get to send to perform labor for the, uh, for the local Spanish overlord. Now in terms of Spain's possessions, we're going to focus more on North America. And there are two areas in North America which the, Spain, or which the Spanish have the strongest presence. Uh, the first one is Florida, and the second one is New Mexico. So if you can remember, maybe we'll make a note here. Uh, Spanish, go ahead and do it down here. Spanish North America. Because recall the capital of New Spain is Mexico City. And for the most part, much of the silver and the wealth that Spain got out of the New World is coming from uh, Mexico, Central America, you know, the silver mines there. So the Spanish don't really have a lot, a big presence in North America, but they certainly have one. Uh, Spanish North America equals Florida, Florida, and New Mexico, right? Those are the areas. So in those areas, first of all, uh, Florida. So Florida, for the most part, serves for Spain more of a military purpose, right? That is the uh, purpose for Spanish Florida. St. Augustine is the city that the Spanish uh, set up. Uh, so how did the Spain come, or how did Spain come to Florida? Well, they had a rival European power encroach upon their territory, and those were the Huguenots. Huguenots are French Protestants. Recall that France was primarily a Catholic nation, but there were French Protestants or Huguenots who were seeking religious refuge, and they decided to settle in Florida. They established a fort at Fort Caroline, so we might say of Fort Caroline, this was a Huguenot fort or fortification. 
And when the Spanish heard about this, they sent up a, a group of soldiers. Now recall that Spain is Catholic, the French Huguenots are Protestants. Knowing what we know about the wars of religion, it was unacceptable, right? The conflict between Catholics and Protestants. We might say of this conflict in Europe spilled, and this is true for really the entire colonial era, the conflict in Europe spilled into the New World. And this is certainly the rule of the colonial era and not the exception. And the Spanish gave the Huguenots a, an ultimatum, convert to Catholicism or face the consequences. A number of French Protestants refused to convert and the Spanish massacred them. So we might say of the massacre, uh, Protestants killed for not converting. Not con and with that, the Spanish set up a permanent military presence to ward off any sort of outside um, outside intruders. They also came into contact with the Timucua Indians. We might say the Timucua, they are the local native tribe. Uh, much like native peoples in most parts of North America, the Spanish looked to convert those people. And uh, the Spanish continued to have a presence in St. Augustine. You see a fortification here because there were pirates and privateers like Sir Francis Drake. Sir Francis Drake was an English, we'll just call it pirate, privateer. He was hired by England. English pirate who, um, we say, we'll just say stole from Spain. And the idea was that Florida could serve as a way to protect uh, Spanish possessions from any outside pirating, et cetera, et cetera. So the Spanish maintained a presence there, uh, especially if you have a, you know, if you can look at a map, um, it guards St. Augustine, Florida, in a lot of ways guards Spain's kind of like northern border when it comes to colonial possessions. So that's what uh, the Spanish were doing in Florida. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, it was a similar but yet different story. In Santa Fe, New Mexico, it was more about converting the local Pueblo, so the Pueblo Indians local to New Mexico. It was more about converting the Pueblo to Catholicism. In New Mexico, there really was no financial gain that was there. Instead, there were a handful of Spanish settlers, uh, but mostly it was the presence of the Catholic Church. However, this conversion of the Pueblo to Catholicism caused problems between Spain and the Pueblo, uh, especially kind of the harsh ways that the Spanish missionaries sought conversion, the harsh punishments that the Spanish missionaries and Spanish authorities um, gave out when Pueblos attempted to practice their indigenous religion, one individual, Pope, he organized many Pueblo people in a revolt against Spanish authority. So we might say Pope, he is the leader of the Pueblo revolt. And the Pueblo revolt is the kicking Spain out of New Mexico. And again, the, um, you know, the, the reason for it, or at least uh, the major motivation for that, was this conversion and sort of the harsh way we might go ahead and say about converting the Pueblo caused problems between the Spain, Spain and the Pueblo. We might also just make a note that it was very harsh. The punishments, the religious punishments were very, very, very harsh. So the Spanish were expelled for a short period of time. Uh, the Pueblo revolt occurred in 1680. In 1692, the Spanish returned and established a presence in New Mexico that really lasted all the way up until the mid-1800s when the United States assumed control of that territory.